Okay. Public meeting of the City of Tallahassee Independent Access Board is now called to order on this day, June 15, 2021, at 4 8 p.m. The board members are present here at the City Hall along with members of the public. Please be sure to submit to Mr. Floyd a speaker form if you wish to speak at the appropriate time on the agenda. Others among the public are also attending this meeting through a digital platform that is accessible at the board's website. With the assistance of the Communications Department and the Information Technology Department, this meeting is live streamed on the Ethics Office webpage and we're recording it for future reference. There's a delay with the online communications and we should be all patient. We thank those members of the City of Tallahassee for their support. At this time, let's rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Chair, um, Carlos Ray, William Graham, Here. Brian Smith, Ernie Payne, Here. Ruby Barr, Present. Kristen Costa, Here. and Robin Blank. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a call. Procedures for public comment conduct public comment. For those attending the meeting online, please make sure your microphone is muted. Last week, we asked the public to make a request by email to ethics at telegov.com by 1 p.m. on the day of the meeting. If you wish to speak online on agenda or non-agenda items, those who have submitted their names will be given a chance to speak as scheduled. For those of you who are present and wish to speak, please complete a request form and forward it to the ethics officer, Mr. Dwight Floyd. Has everyone received the agenda and supporting documents? Report the agenda or procedures for conducting today's business. Are there any questions or concerns? Have you all read the minutes for the, from the last meeting? Any concerns, questions, edits? A motion to accept the, to approve the minutes. Motion to accept. A motion to have second. second. Motion second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. This time, any public comment on agenda items, Mr. Floyd? Don't have any comments. Okay. Moving on to office report. Second. And now I have to take a deep breath. <laughs> Slow down. Um, and uh, I don't have anything from that really stands out. We finished. Um, with delivering, well, we're still delivering the online course. Uh, it's now at over 2,000 uh, employees that have reviewed the course, and nothing's blown up. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're pleased. We've gotten a good reception from that. Um, yeah, I've delivered the, I believe I delivered the ethics course twice in the last period and um, addressed addressing calls as they come. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're moving forward with, we're moving forward at this point in looking at the um, campaign contribution and, and trying to put a, together a plan for that. Lucy has been doing research for us and uh, we're gonna follow up on, so I'll have something to bring to you to get some suggestions from you at the next meeting. Uh, for the budget, um, I have to look at it. I think John took off the bulk of the money. <laughs> uh, earned, earned the money. Right? <laughs> Did you earn it? <laughs> yeah, I think he earned it. Um, there's a little bit here. I think at the next meeting you'll see the expenses for the um, training material. Um, do you have any questions on anything that's in the budget? Okay. And I don't have anything to report on complaints at this time. Any questions from the board regarding the report or the budget? 
I was just curious, um, Dwight. Sure. Was there any? Did you see? Was there anyone that contacted you following the news reports that um, some of the um, uh, text messages related to the lawsuit that's going on? Because no. that nothing. Okay. No. I was wondering if that triggered anything in anyone. No. Okay. No. Questions on the office report. We'll move on to old business then. That'll be Mr. Reed. Okay. Are you there? Okay. Uh, so at our last meeting, we discussed the misuse of public position, and the board provided direction that one wished to proceed. So I drafted some language. I do want to thank uh, Robin Blank for for helping out in the last month. Uh, we work uh, closely together to work on this language, and I think we've gotten a good place. So. Uh, we we addressed two sections dealing with misuse, and and then I, I threw in another section because when we sent the language to the city commission for adoption that first time, uh, they made some stylistic changes that actually uh, changed the intent of the ordinance so that we had an issue with covered individuals, so I went and fixed that. But um, I'll go into the three sections individually. Misuse of public position, we uh, left it as we had agreed. Uh, no corruptly language, as we discussed. However, we did provide language that came from a Commission on Ethics opinion uh, regarding a Mayor Thomas Marini, and they essentially said that uh, for misuse it had to be inconsistent with the proper performance of his or her office. So I went ahead and added that language in here, and I think that would help us uh, if we deal with if somebody's doing tweets or, or promoting a business that is something you would expect from an elected official, but technically runs afoul of the ordinance. I think that gives us the, the latitude we need to, to allow that to occur. Uh, section 2 deals with the penalty section. Uh, we had mentioned that we wanted to kind of follow the approach that we've seen, I think, in, in Jacksonville and maybe Miami-Dade, I think it was. Uh, they provided for dismissal of complaints, which allowed them to enter into like, stipulations and they could offer a letter of instruction. The way our ordinance is written now, we can only <laughs> issue a letter of instruction if we find a violation of the code. And there may be some individuals that don't want to enter into a stipulation where they have to admit to wrongdoing. So we, we keep, so there was a, a, a paragraph A, a subsection A was missing uh, in, the, in, the, in the ordinance. So we add that A, so that's just a, to fix a typo that was in the ordinance. Uh, B is left the way it is. C is brand new, which allows us to essentially kind of follow what the other jurisdictions do where we can dismiss. Um, they had letter of instruction. I went a little further. I put including but not limited to, so we're actually not limited here, but I also wanted to add oral reprimand, written reprimand, and of course, the additional ethics training since we have... You're doing such good do not courses. Use my training to so, punish yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was my joke, by the way. <laughs> so, um, so, so, illuminating people. <laughs> so, we added that in, and and I wanted to maybe, uh, Robin, if you wanted to address this, because I know you had uh, raised an issue about, um, I guess, well, so it's. The board, at its discretion, can um, dismiss if it's unintentional or if or inadvertent or unintentional. I think the other language had unsubstantial, which we all agreed we take out, so that's not here. But then the other language is that it would uh, the public interest would not be served. Um, that kind of gives us some latitude to be a little subjective in our closed sessions. And I think Robin raised the concern: Do we want to go that road? So I know we had. Talk about maybe Robin raising that at the meeting. Yeah. I don't know if this is helpful or if this just makes things more difficult, but the argument that the public interest would not be served by proceeding further, any, any proceeding is going to be more than zero dollars of taxpayer money for the board or for the office to proceed. So I think be argued that it is always in the public's interest to preserve money or to to close proceedings and so you would always have that argument available you'd also have the argument available if someone is um, 
a, a commissioner or someone of high stature that the disruption to the general operation of the city is being affected by the pursuit of the matter, and therefore it would be in the public interest to get it done more quickly than as provided in the ordinances. Um, people would raise those arguments, and we would have to make decisions about whether those carry the day. And so I just wanted to throw that out there um, in, in case it, it helped us determine if that language is useful to us or if we think that it might otherwise be, be a hindrance because it's, yeah. it's too broad or it, it gives too much discretion. But I, I would love for someone to push back and say, I can think of a situation where the public interest would not be served by, by closing a matter out. And do, do we need it? Just looking at the language itself, can we just, with the second half saying, when the ethics board dismisses a complaint, isn't the issue we have right now is we can't dismiss a complaint even though we know it's unintentional. And we want to dismiss, but also give instruction. Do we need that whole part of saying at the discretion we dismiss a complaint because it's not serves a public, we can dismiss a complaint for other reasons without having that in there. Do we need that in there as? I, I I raised the issue, what if somebody did something that was intentional, but it was so de minimis that we felt that we didn't need to go forward? This is, I think, I see that more for the de minimis violation, something that's, you know, you know, maybe we could, a letter of instruction is all we need to do uh, without going, and that, that preserves it. But I think it, it does give the board the discretion to, to make the ultimate decision. And while we would do that in a closed session, that would ultimately become public, so if there were the public, they'd be able to check our work and make sure we weren't dismissing everything that, that was not in public interest. So I think there's always going to be an opportunity to, to to make sure we're doing that. That was just to make sure we don't tie our hands, because I think one of the reasons we're changing this is we kind of tied our hands by making it too narrow to begin with. This gives us a little discretion, um, inadvertent or unintentional, how do we define that? Was the act itself unintentional, or was it that the act violated the ethics code unintentional and that's that so we can have we have basically that phrase we can remove that and still get to the same and we don't need that the phrasing of not the public interest we can still we can just say it this position should have determined that the alleged violation was inadvertent or unintentional okay. Go ahead. i was just Let's going to say my only concern with that would be we, having been together a couple months, kind of know everyone's thoughts and we know what we're thinking, but this has to also, if you're not the council anymore and we're not on the board, this has to be, people I think might interpret that sentence a little different, mm -hmm. would they not be like-minded like we are at the moment? Um, and we don't know who's going to sit on this board in 2, 10, 20 years. And so that somebody... Our goal is to not have any corruption and not have anything like that. And mm -hmm. if this board got made up of a different group of people potentially one day, we don't want it to be swept under the rug as, oh, well, we don't, the public doesn't need to know this. It's not in their best interest. So that would be my only concern with that phrase in there. So I'd be more for maybe taking out that public interest just because I'm thinking down the road if it's not me um, and it's another group of people that just has different thoughts than I do at this moment, um, that that may be a little self-serving and may help them out in a different way. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes, sir. My, I, I fully agree with the intent here, but my concern would be uh, if people would raise the question, if we have the legal right to determine the public interest, this board, since we are not elected officials in that regard, I, I don't know if uh, that would be a legal question that I'm not qualified to answer, but uh, I, I can see somebody raising that question. If, we at some point say we are dismissing this because it's not in the public interest. People are going to say, who are you to say that? And I would argue if someone has brought it to our attention, there's someone in the public that has a significant <laughs> interest <laughs> in it. <laughs> so do we want to, I, I, if, if that's the direction the board wishes to go, I would, after the word determine, I would delete that the public interest would not be served by proceeding further or... So it would just read that determined that it appears the alleged violation was inadvertent or unintentional. And then just let us stop. Just more uh, scriveners. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, we all agree on that? We'll vote on this. Sure. So, we have a motion to accept the proposed or the draft ordinance with the proposed edits. I'll second. Second. Any discussion? All those favor? Aye. I thought we were only voting on the amendment because I, I didn't get to the last section. I thought that it's going to oh, make. It's not much, yeah. What's left? But if, if I, I could just get to it, it's very, very yeah. easy. Um, 217, when we sent it to the city commission for adoption, it said a public official or employee of the city shall not disclose or use information that is not a blah, 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 blah. And it says, for his or her personal gain or benefit, which is the language we sent. They took out the pronoun and replaced it with the noun covered individuals. But covered individuals is a term that we find elsewhere in the ordinance, so, so it contradicted itself. So, um, so we delete covered individuals and we just uh, repeat, this is language Robin proposed, instead of um, Going back to the his or her pronouns, we just repeat public official or employee of the city or city employee, uh, personal gain. So that's so that's really just a, a scrivener's or something that was lost in translation when we sent it to the city commission. Votes? I don't think so. Okay. What's the next stage for this point? Um, we could send it to the city. Okay. Sounds good. We'll drop the letter with us. Yes. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Any other comments, questions on old business? Moving on to approval or advisory opinion. Okay. Uh, this is uh, AO 2021-04. This was requested by um, um, a coordinator in the HR department regarding whether uh, the mandatory training uh, ethics training was required of independent contractors, um, and the answer was, was no. Um, the second question was then, if it is, we have to give them access to the computer program, but that was moot, so that was not, not addressed. Uh, but um, there's a long line of, of cases from the Commission on Ethics that say that independent contractors are not employees for the purposes of the ethics code at the state level. Uh, so therefore, we uh, have no jurisdiction over independent contractors. Now, uh, one thing that we did see in Miami-Dade, they didn't bring independent contractors under their code, but one area where they did is that anybody who makes a bid to do anything to the procurement process is required to seek an advisor opinion to accompany their bids to ensure that there's nobody gets tripped up down the road. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's that's a little different than this. We don't have that here in Tallahassee. That's something that Miami does, and they actually do it quite extensive, uh, extensively. Um, that's why they have so many opinions down there. <laughs> uh, but um, but absent language like that, we are bound to just the employees, officers, local officials, board members, and employees. Like I said, you can see there's numerous cases from the commission that say that they are not um, independent contractors or not. So, so that's essentially the advisory opinion. Okay. Any comments, questions from the board? On the advisory opinion. Mm -hmm. the, yes, sir. Uh, it seems to me that we had some discussion on this back when we were working out in code. And I'm not sure if we actually discussed including contractors, but I think we may have discussed including something in the contracts. That required the contractor or the company to abide uh, by the ethics code. Remember anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I just recall off my head. Um, yeah. about it. Can we search our minutes? Yeah. Is that possible? It does sound a little familiar. Yeah. Um, this is just how the little clause in there saying you refer to uh, the ordinance. Yeah. Okay. For all, all contracts for <laughs> that would involve. I don't know. Are, can the minutes be searched? Yeah, I'm sure. Lucy, do you know? Can you search the minutes to, for terms? I can't hear you. Can, can you, you search, search the, minutes? the minutes for terms? Is that possible to do? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I don't want you. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> just, just for the next meeting to see if there is something. So it's on uh, contracts. Basically, searching contracts and ethics. Yeah. Uh, applying the ethics code, code, code to, to, contracts. to uh, new contracts. Mr. Chair, I think our contracts do have a provision to that effect already. I don't know if it came from this board, but I'm pretty sure. I'm sure it did. The procurement contract. The procurement process has a provision in it. I'm gonna get a copy of that. Oh. Um, I can bring it. I mean, I can get it to, to Dwight. That'd be great. Okay. Look at us. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are going to miss me. <laughs> Assuming I get confirmed. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments on the uh, advisory opinion? I mean, to vote on this? Yeah, need to yes. approve it. Do I have a motion to approve the advisory opinion? Sure. Motion from Mr. Payne. I'll second. Second from Ms. Blank. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Yes, Are we going to be compiling? Is there a place where people can go? And, John, when you write these advisory we, we are, We're working on it now. Okay. Yes. 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 Approved, uh, draft websites. Okay. That. Awesome. Okay. That's our goal. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to the summary of the Inspector General's ethics audit. And thank you. I asked uh, Inspector Dennis Sutton to come and, and share, and he's here today as our guest to um, share the report. And I will tell you that he actually told me about it when I first uh, arrived, so I've been aware for a long time. Uh, but he couldn't share it with us before he shared it with his bosses, which is reasonable and logical. Mr. Sutton. You want me to do it from here? Sit so the, the mics, the mics are picking you up. Those green lights right there. So you would just do it from here instead yeah. of on camera? That's fine. <laughs> um, okay. Well, first, let me give you a little bit of background about this audit. Uh, by internal auditing standards, we're required to periodically assess the ethical environment of the organization, whether it's a corporate organization, a government. This being a government environment, we, uh, we've assessed the city's ethical culture. Um, the, the last time this audit was conducted was 2008, so it's been quite a long time since this has been done. Um, the periodic is not defined in the audit standards, uh, but, but after I became city auditor, I felt like this is something we really need to get on and, and started that audit, get it going. Um, the objectives of the audit <clears throat> were determine whether the city employees understood the city's ethical values and could apply those values to their business life, your daily activities. And then the second objective was to determine the extent of compliance with key ethics related policies and procedures. So to do this, the, the, to meet those objectives, we evaluated city policies and how, it, how they impacted the culture of the city. We conducted a survey of all city employees and we, uh, we reviewed certain aspects of city operations for implementation of those ethics policies. Um, since it had been so long since the previous ethic culture evaluation was done, the previous audit, uh, I thought it was really important to, uh, to include a section of the audit report that discussed what's happened in those intervening 10 years and, and has impacted the, the ethical culture of the city, both good and bad. There's been a lot that's happened in those 10 years, as all of you, I'm sure, are well aware of. Your board has been established in those 10 years. Um, the city's ethics code has been strengthened and revised since then. We've had some bad things. Uh, there's been a commissioner that was indicted and pled guilty, or no contest. I'm not sure what exactly the legal term for the plea that he, he, he entered, but um, we had some ethics stuff go before the state ethics commission so there's been a lot that's happened in the intervening 10 years uh, since the last audit <clears throat> um, and if you look at the first the first slide you can just see here for the first page there's been a lot of turnover in city leadership in those 10 years um, for all of the commissioners have moved over multiple times the uh, appointed officials have all flipped over at least once. Three of the four flipped over two or more times. So, so there's been a lot of change in the, the, the leadership of the city over those 10 years as well. 
which which really kind of sets the the tone at the top for the organization is what we look for from your city leadership. Um, so, so that just kind of sets the stage for for where the the results of the audit came from. The uh, the biggest part of the audit that I thought was the most impactful was a city survey of city employees. And it really, it really put a highlight on some things that, that are important to point out. Uh, I don't think there's anything here that was really unexpected. Um, and, and, and maybe, if anything, the unexpected part was that the survey results were as good as they were. I expected it possibly to be a little bit worse. Uh, the, the, we broke the survey up into four parts. The, uh, the first part was to determine employees familiarity with the city's ethical efforts and as you can see on the next page next slide um, it's gone up across the board every single one the city's done a good job of communicating my conclusion from this is the city's done a good job of communicating the importance of ethics and, and what the city's trying to do to improve the ethical uh, environment of the city the the next page goes into the part of the survey where we talk about or we try to get into employees' ability to uh, apply ethical concepts to, to different situations. Uh, one of the things about the survey is that we use the same questions that were done and used in 2008, so we have some comparability over time. These aren't necessarily the questions that I would have picked if I had designed the survey myself. But I thought it was more important to have that comparability over time. Uh, if you look at some of these questions, I think they're they're fairly easy questions. They're not really in a deep gray area making ethical decisions. But but you can see across the board um, the results have improved. That, that questions like is it okay to um, claim a meal on your travel expense when a meal was provided. Most people will say, no, it's not right to claim reimbursement for a meal that you didn't have to pay for. And you can see that between agree and strongly disagree in 2019, it's what, 97% of the people agreed that it's not right. So I feel like the employees can do a really good job of applying ethical decision making. Uh, the next section of the survey touched on the employee perception of the ethical environment. And, and this is where the, the survey kind of touches on the employee's perception of where are we at ethically as an organization. And if you look at the, at the chart, the, the set of graphs that we have here, you can see that from 2008 to 2019, across the board, the results have gone down, which was just totally to be expected. Um, and, and honestly, like I told the commission the other night, if it hadn't gone down, I would have thought there was something wrong with the survey, with what's happened in the intervening 10 years. Um, so, but, but you can see that now in 2019, the distribution is, is pretty much a, a regular bell curve, like you'd expect to see across the board um, in, a, in a standard distribution. Now, it's obviously not what we want. We want leaning more towards the positive than the negative, but, but, but I'm, I'm not totally unhappy with where we're at considering all factors. The, the one thing that I really did want to point out on this page, though, is the last graph on the bottom right-hand corner that asks, since the leadership changes in 2018, which involved four of the five commissioners and three of the four appointed officials, do the employees feel like the city's moving in the right direction from an ethical standpoint? And you can see here 75% of the employees responded positively. They feel like the city is moving in the right direction at this point. So I, I thought that was a fairly strong and, and positive statement. The, uh, the next set of graphs um, kind of have good and bad here. Um, the first one talks about employees having personal knowledge of unethical or illegal conduct. And you can see from 2008, it went down from 35 percent sayings that they saw had seen something down to 18 percent now so that's a good thing that, that among the rank and file they're not reporting seeing things that are unethical or illegal uh, but the next slide is just as troubling if not more troubling to me 
And that's of those that said yes, they had seen something, did they say anything? And 75% didn't report that they had seen something inappropriate or unethical happening. So that, that's troubling to me and something that I really hope we can address going forward as an organization. The, uh, the last slide has to do with our observations and recommendations from the audit. And I kind of feel like the first two observations and recommendations are somewhat tied together and they go right to the heart of that last graph that we, we looked at. Um, I think the commission should establish a whistleblower and anti-fraud policies, both. Um, I think it's important. We have it in ordinance. We already have whistleblower provisions in ordinance, but I, I feel like the commission should make a statement to that effect through policy for both of those areas. And uh, working with the city manager, we're both going to work together to develop those policies and bring it back to the city commission after their summer break. So sometime in the fall, we'll have these, the, the plan is to have those policies coming back before the commission. Um, and the, the, the second one has to do with community, continued communication from city leadership of the importance of um, ethics, what our expectations are for employees. And, and both of those together, the hope and is that it will address that idea of not reporting things when they see them. Um, it's kind of tough to, to, to make it happen, but if you can change the perception of employees that, that they're doing the right thing when they report and there's not going to be retribution or retaliation and it just makes it a better organization, organization for everybody, I, I think we can tackle that 75% and bring that number way, way down. Um, the, the next issue or observation that we had was the codification of directives regarding annual ethics training. Currently, the uh, employee's cost of living adjustment is tied to completion of the annual ethics training, and that's based on a city manager directive. Um, there was discussion by the city commission whether it's proper, reasonable, appropriate, whatever term you want to use, to, to tie somebody's um, pay to attending training. That they could be an excellent employee all year long, off the charts on how great they are. They miss their training for one day, one hour worth of training, and they don't get a cost of living adjustment. So there was some questioning whether that was reasonable to, to hold employees to that. Um, we didn't opine on whether that was reasonable or appropriate. What we said was that if that is something that the city manager is going to continue, he should codify it in policy and not strictly as a city manager directive. Um, that, that's something that he, he needs to work forward on. Um, my feeling is that they, 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 it's reasonable to keep those tied together. That it's, it's not unreasonable that ethics training is important, but maybe there's a different mechanism than your, somebody's pay rate to tie that to. That's something for the city manager to look into. But whatever he decides, it should be done in policy. Um, we, we reviewed outside employment forms for employees to disclose conflicts of interest, potential conflicts of interest. Where are they working when they're not working for the city? And we saw that employees, looks like it's hard to tell if somebody has a second job and they don't tell you to find that out. But from the forms that we did have, we, we looked at them and we saw that, that employees had filed the forms like they're supposed to, but it doesn't look like anybody was really looking at those forms to, to do anything with it. Um, we, what we did was we took those, those forms and we compared the, the secondary employers and looked at the city, city vendor list and see if there's any matching between city vendors and who they reported working for and what was done to make sure there wasn't a conflict of interest there. And we saw, we, not, not a huge number, but there were a, a number of items, uh, instances where we saw employees were working for city vendors and there was nothing anywhere that indicated it had been reviewed, it had been checked, verified there isn't a conflict of interest. There's all kinds of instances where there may be no conflict of interest. So a lot of firefighters work secondary employment just based on the nature of their work schedule. And so, 
if they're working secondary employment for a landscape company doing, you know, mowing, whatever, that wouldn't really be a conflict of interest with their firefighter job. But say, say a scenario where someone is a energy auditor and they're going around helping, helping citizens improve the efficiency of their house. Well, if they're, they're working a secondary employment job, say doing air conditioning repair or replacement, that could set up a situation where there could be a conflict of interest if they're, they're working for somebody and they're also making recommendations for people to upgrade their air conditioning unit. That type of stuff should be, should be looked into to make sure there isn't any issues there from an ethical or conflict of interest standpoint. So, so we've made some recommendations for people to, for, for, for the people that receive these forms to, to do some reviews and make sure that there aren't conflict of interest as far as we can tell. Um, we also looked at the uh, conflict of interest forms that are pr produced and provided as part of RFP and RFQ evaluation committees. Um, and we saw that when we were doing that, we looked at a few procurements that went through the RFP process, and we saw that those forms weren't always being completed as they should be. So we've made recommendations that that really needs to be tightened up, and those forms should be, should be done the way they're supposed to. And that if there are conflicts of interest, the people should have to recuse themselves from being part of that evaluation committee. And then the last, the last recommendation we had dealt with um, a vendor, establishing a vendor code of ethics as part of the procurement process. Require it and disclose it within the RFP uh, so that if, if someone wants to do business with the city, they have to abide by the city's vendor code of ethics. It's kind of a, become a, a, a trend across, across the country to establish vendor codes of ethics. Uh, and, and so that, that, that's the audit. I, th I think it was a good audit. I think we, we highlighted some areas that, that need improvement. I think we kind of showed that the, the ethical culture has changed over time, but, but it's, not, it's not in a terrible shape. I think we're overall, we're, we're actually, I think we're in a good shape, and I think we're getting better. And, and it, it, the audit didn't address this because obviously I'm not independent from the ethics board, but, but I think the, the low number of complaints that you all have received says something also about the ethical culture of the rank and file with the employees. Um, but that, that, that's just my own personal opinion and, and couldn't be in any way codified in an audit. But that's just a personal opinion. So, so I'm, I'm open to any questions that you all might have. So, as I said the other night, I, I think that was it's, the report is well done. I think the audit was well done. You have a, uh, a completion date on the action plan of December 31st. The plan's in place now to get that on the city commission agenda to get her, have a report on that. On the the, the follow-up on these? Yes, the, the action plan for... The, the, the follow-up process we use in the Inspector General's office, uh, previous to me, every six months we would follow up on the status of action plan steps. And it turned out to be very time-consuming for my staff from, from producing the reports and... Um, just time back and forth with management, checking the status of where these different things, because obviously we have a lot of audits that we've done. And so there's a lot of steps that we follow up on. I've, I've reduced it to once a year now that we're going to follow up to just try and be more efficient with my staff's time to doing audits instead of following up. It, it, management's responsibility is to get this done. It's not our responsibility to look over their shoulders and force it to be done. Or, or, you know, keep a hammer beating on them to get this stuff done. But we do want to follow up and let people know, is the city being successful on following up on these steps? So, so we wouldn't look at this again until after March 31st of next year. That's our follow-up. Once a year, as of March 31st, we do our follow-ups. Long story to get to a short answer. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you uh, for your comments and for the audit. Can you ballpark for me the sample sizes for the 2008 survey and the more recent one? I know that it was sent to every single city email. So whatever the city employee count was, I believe it was about 3,500 this time in, in the 2008. I, okay. I, I don't want to hazard a guess. 
Since it was 27%. Mr. Sutton, to follow up to Robin's question, were they able to, assuming they were able to respond anonymously? Yes, yes, we did it. We did online anonymously. Okay. Um, the, the hope was is that people would feel free to, to provide responses without any fear. Um, and so we did it through online survey, not directly through us with a third party vendor. What percentage responded? I believe it was. A, Shy of 30%. 27. 27. Page seven. 27. Oh, we got to page seven, yeah. And a half. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought it was just shy of 30% responded. Is that, I, I don't know, is that, is that a, con I mean, is that a considered a decent number when you're? Some well, of maybe this is just know, my personal John. opinion, but I don't think in general surveys get good responses mm -hmm. unless, you know, I, I feel like the people most likely to respond to surveys are somebody that have an issue to begin with. And so that's partly why I expected the survey to skew more to the negative than it did is because, you know, it's usually, it seems to me that people that are discontent are the ones most likely to take the time and effort to respond to a survey if they've got something that they have a concern about and they want to communicate it. But that, that's just personal opinion there. I don't have anything to support that. And I'm assuming that the reason that the... Uh, survey was the information the data was collected in 2019 or in here we are in 2021 was COVID and everything that interceded COVID, everything yeah. else along the way yeah yeah and, and th that percentage would be going back to my days working with the psychometrician um, that percentage would be more than representative of a all population Thank you. Thank you. Um, the procurement process, just wondering, I don't mm -hmm. know what it applies. The state standards for procurement, I know in the state contracts, they include fine penalties and fine deliverables. Is that something acquired at the city level for contracts or procurement process? It depends on the contract and what we're, what we're purchasing. So has, there's different standards depending on what you're purchasing? Right, right. And it, uh, I believe, and I, I'm not 100% sure, but it also varies based on the size of the contract, too, as to what level of detail is involved. Um, I hate to give the answer, but it depends. Yeah, and the same thing with the same, same state contract, depending on the amount, if it's $35,000 or above, yeah. you're required to have deliverables, defined deliverables and defined mm -hmm. penalties. And, and that's something that we look for whenever we do audits of contracts, is how well have the deliverables been defined? Are they tied back to some type of a needs assessment where it's clearly defined what the need is? And it does everything all fit together and make sense the way you'd expect it to? And we have those standards here set in the city? Yes. Yep. Any other questions? Mr. Sun, now that we have them here. No? Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank Sun. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate it. Moving on to agenda item number 10, defining procurement employee. Uh, yes, this is an issue we discussed at the last meeting. I think we had conversations with uh, the city attorney's office about our definition of procurement employee and if it's too broad and, and might ensnare people that are not intended to be captured in this. So um, if you go to page two of my memo, I went ahead and took our definition and I broke it in did it in an outline format so I could separate every element to look at them individually. Um, so the, the two issues that, that I found somewhat problematic and that we've discussed with the city attorney's office was uh, E and G, the preparation of any part of a purchase request and then rendering advice. Um, and the reason that for that preparation of any part, it doesn't really go into, if, if you're setting criteria that's going to be part of the the decision process, then obviously I think you would assume they'd be covered. But if somebody is making photocopies, would that be somebody we're intending to cover for this? Um, and, the, and the language doesn't really address that. Rendering advice, um, the advice is being done informally in a casual setting versus obviously if it's being done towards the decision-making process, we would want that to be covered. So, um, so I think those were... Two of the issues that we looked at, I went to the Commission on Ethics 
to the Attorney General's office, um, this definition, because we, we actually took our definition from state statute, word for word. And um, and there's there's nothing written up on it at the state level to see. Um, our language is, is pretty consistent. It's used in other jurisdictions. Actually, so I think the city of Atlanta also uses it word for word, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, my recommendation, if you just skip to the end, is that we, we just leave it alone and, and address it as, as needed. If somebody were to come forward with an advisory opinion, we could readdress. If somebody uh, were the subject of a complaint, the only issue we could address it then. Uh, the concern that I have is that uh, under, under Florida law, we are, we are authorized to be an ethics board that imposes um, more stringent standards than those imposed by the state. So the concern I would have is if we removed any elements of the procurement employee, do we now make us less stringent than what the state requires? Now, the flip side of that is that there are two issues. This is really the procurement employee really is only covered within our gift ban provision of the ethics code. And in state statute, there's actually two provisions dealing with gifts. There's 112.313 which requires a showing that the gift is being given for the purpose of influencing some type of decision. And then there's three, um, 112.3148, which I reference here, which is where they have outright bans, but you're allowed to receive a contribution up to $25. And then if it's over 25, but under 100, you have to report it court or the, the gift giver needs to report it quarterly. And then you're not allowed to take anything over a hundred. So we obviously we removed that, that, um, monetary value from our gift ban recently. So we made our gift ban much more stringent than what the state provides. So I think there is an argument that we said if we were to tinker with the procurement employee, since our gift ban is much more stringent than what the state provides, we might be able to fall within that area. But that's a bigger discussion for another day, I would assume. So I, I wanted to bring that to our attention, and, and, and I just kind of wanted to dive into it and make sure we're not casting that too wide but at the same time, not run afoul of what we are authorized to do under state law. So this time, that's a lot, a lot for me to say nothing. So. <laughs> Any comments? You are questions? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Okay. Uh, moving on to public comment on non-agenda items. Do we have any you don't have anything? Any other discussions regarding items for future meetings? Wishes nothing other than what we talked about earlier, which is just to see if there's any contracts, units to contractors, right. and ethics. Any directives for me? Is on it. Any directives for me. Miss <laughs> Barr moves we adjourn. Miss Costa seconds. We are adjourned. <laughs>